Okay, so we will be joined shortly uh, for the first closing congressional keynote with Congresswoman Yvette Clark, who is the representative of the 9th Congressional District of New York. She serves as the chair of the Homeland Cybersecurity Infrastructure Protection and Innovation Subcommittee under the jurisdiction of the House Committee on Homeland Security and was the co-chair of the powerful Energy and Commerce Committee during the 116th Congress. Congresswoman Clark is a graduate of Oberlin College and was a recipient of the prestigious APPAM Sloan Fellowship in Public Policy and Policy Analysis. She received an honorary degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa from the University of Technology in Jamaica and the Honorary Doctorate of Public Policy from the University of the Commonwealth of Caribbean. Congresswoman Clark currently resides in the Flatbush neighborhood in Brooklyn. And I see her on here. Let's see if we can get her to join us. While her uh, video is coming on, uh, she'll be followed by Congressman Ted Liu. And then our final uh, keynote will be a fireside chat with Chris Inglis, who is the nominee for the National Cybersecurity Director. Congresswoman, I see your microphone just came on. Yes, can you uh, see my uh, video? Unfortunately not. It doesn't look like your uh, web camera is on from our angle. Oh, there we go. Nope, that's Congressman okay. Ted Lou. Yeah, uh, <laughs> how do I, how do I use, my, get, I'm using a tablet, so I'm wondering whether uh, there's something that I need to do to uh, enable the camera. Uh, I'm not sure. I saw your camera earlier when you first called on and there was something obstructing it. So I'm not. I'm right. Not sure so that's that. why I used my tablet. I'm tr trying to see whether there's an icon. Let's see. Nope. That's not it. Let's see. Oh, that's not it. You'll see. Okay, I'm having a bit of technical difficulty here. Um, let me. Which would you like, Congressman Lou, to go first um, while would, we we work the technical I, difficulties? I, 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 yes, I think that that would uh, that would probably be best. I, I apologize. No problem, ma'am. We look forward to seeing you shortly. Uh, Congressman Liu, if you can come back on while I introduce you. Uh, Congressman Ted Liu represents California's 33rd Congressional District in the United States House of Representatives. Congressman Liu is serving in his third term in Congress and currently sits on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He was also elected by his Democratic colleagues to serve as a co-chair of the Democratic Policy and Communications Committee. Congressman Liu is a former active duty officer in the U.S. Air Force and currently serves as a colonel in the reserves stationed at Los Angeles Air Force Base. He attended Stanford for his undergraduate degrees in computer science and political science and the Georgia, Georgetown University where he received his law degree magna cum laude. Um, from one officer to another, floor is yours, sir. I'm sorry, your audio is not on. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. You're ready to go. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Bryson, for your uh, introduction. The only thing I would add to that is I'm a recovering uh, computer science major. And want to uh, thank uh, ICS Village and R Street and all the participants today uh, for uh, attending Hack the Capital. I think it's fantastic. You're bringing so many people together. And as all of you who are watching this know, uh, we're really far behind security both in the uh, federal uh, level as well as in the private sector. And I thought I'd just start with a story. A couple of years ago, I had the chance to attend DEF CON uh, in Las Vegas. As many of you know, it is a convention of hackers. And I remember I was in this really large auditorium, since in Vegas they have really large auditoriums. And there were thousands of people in the audience. And first of all, my first thought was, maybe this was not such a good idea to be in front of thousands of hackers. But in any event, uh, it went well. And a question was asked uh, to everyone 
in the auditorium. Uh, how many of them um, knew who their uh, member of Congress was? And I think, I don't know, maybe a dozen hands went up, including my own staff. And then when the question was asked, how many of you would like to work with your member of Congress or other federal representative on issues uh, related to cyber? And hundreds of hands uh, went up. So clearly there is a, a desire and intent for people who want to get involved with the government and to influence cyber policy and to uh, try to affect uh, how our country deals with cybersecurity. And we have to do a better job of that. So for example, in Congress, I am, well, last term I was one of four recovering computer science majors. I might be one of three now because one of the folks, uh, Congressman Will Hurd, retired. So there is not a lot of technical expertise uh, in your federal government at the elected official level. And then at the staff level, it is not significantly better. You don't see a lot of staff members uh, with computer science degrees or uh, engineering degrees and so on. And to the extent any of you can encourage people to work on Capitol Hill, who do have technical degrees, I think that would be quite helpful. Or supporting fellowships uh, and internships uh, where we can put people with uh, computer science or other technical degrees uh, on the Capitol Hill, I think that would also be helpful uh, because with every passing day, technology becomes more and more important. Now, in terms of uh, how the federal government deals with cybersecurity, uh, it's basically all messed up. Uh, we have so many different offices and departments and uh, crisscross lines of communication. So for example, you've got the Office of Management and Budget uh, in the executive branch that has a big part to play with uh, cyber. Then you've got uh, the Pentagon, you've got uh, the US Cyber Command, then you have folks within the White House. Um, every administration every now and then will have a cybersecurity czar. Uh, you got folks at the NSC, uh, you have folks at DHS. So it is very confusing sometimes uh, who is responsible for what. And uh, I think it'd be better if we could unify all of this within either a single uh, agency, uh, one uh, at, at least at the federal civilian side. The military tends to be better. The military does have US Cyber Command. Uh, military is, is, uh, has much more clear lines of communication, but at the .gov level on the federal civilian side, it is all over the map. And I think it'd be helpful if we had one unified agency that deals with cyber issues. I also think in Congress, you have a similar problem. We have five to six different committees that have jurisdiction over technology and cyber issues. I think it would make much more sense to have a new technology committee that deals with cyber, deals with uh, contracting issues, deals with the cloud, um, and, and so on. Unfortunately, trying to get any committee in Congress to give up any part of its jurisdiction is like pulling teeth. Uh, so that is uh, something that is hard to do, but I do think we need to do that. We are now in the 21st century. Um, a lot of our committees haven't changed very much, and I think we need to recognize the new reality and have one committee that deals primarily with uh, cyber issues. And then in terms of legislation, I just want to highlight some of the bills uh, that I've been working on. Uh, trying to address the lack of a cyber workforce uh, is a problem. And last term, I introduced the new Collar Jobs Act. We're going to reintroduce that again. It gives tax credits to companies, uh, for example, uh, to uh, try to uh, have folks go and uh, take a cyber uh, career field. Um, there are other provisions in it as well, and all my staff sent out uh, to the folks who are interested. And then I also want to uh, sort of talk about how we can do cyber at the foreign policy level. I'm on House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, we have a bill that would create essentially sort of a cyber office uh, in the State Department that will better equip the State Department in dealing with cyber issues. And then in the consumer protection area, I think we have to also educate consumers on cyber issues. Uh, so for example, if you were to go to Target and buy a lamp, you would not expect that when you brought that lamp home and plugged it in, that it would blow up or do something bad to you. Unfortunately, when you go buy cyber products, um, you don't have that sort of assurance. One reason that that lamp doesn't blow up is because 
it's likely going to have a certification from, for example, Underwriters Laboratory. And the manufacturer of the lamp knows that if they get that certification, uh, then it means that their lamp is likely going to have electrical malfunction and cause a fire. And Target knows that when they sell lamps that have that certification, then it's less likely they're gonna have customers mad because they brought a lamp that blew up. Unfortunately, if you were to go, for example, buy a webcam right now at Target, uh, you wouldn't know, does this webcam have any cybersecurity? Build it and route it so they can start watching you or watching your baby and so on. So Congressman uh, Ed Markey and I have introduced the Cyber Shield app that would create a voluntary certification program where a manufacturer can apply uh, for a Cyber Shield designation if it meets a certain criteria, uh, then uh, it can get this designation and consumers will know, hey, if I spend 50 cents more and buy this webcam, at least I know it has some cybersecurity protection versus if I buy this other webcam that's cheaper without this designation, then bad things may happen if I were to bring it home and plug it in. Um, so hopefully we can get that through. And I think that's something that could get uh, bipartisan support. And then uh, at the end of the day, I think we also have to teach just better cyber hygiene uh, to everyone, both in the public and private sector. Uh, so I am, um, what's the best way to describe this? When I was a young kid, uh, I engaged in some hacking. So thank goodness for the statute of limitations, nothing could happen to me now. I'm not saying I did anything wrong, but just saying. Uh, I'm old enough to know, like, you know, what a blue box is. But in any event, uh, we have to get people uh, to be more cyber aware and just having done stuff in this area, a lot of hacking occurs, not because of technological, amazing malware products, but because of social engineering because your employees inadvertently click on a link they shouldn't have or they inadvertently give out information uh, that they should not. And we have to teach our employees both in the government as well as in companies to just be much better uh, educated and aware of these kinds of cyber issues. The military does a pretty good job. Uh, I served on active duty uh, in the Air Force. I'm still in the reserves. And I can tell you, uh, we routinely have all sorts of trainings. Um, we have to do annual certification on basically cybersecurity. And even before I can use my computer just to use a word processor, it goes through a two-factor authentication where I have to stick in a physical card and then put in a, a separate password. Now, many companies don't even do that. And then a lot of folks in the federal government don't even have that. And so if we could just get two-factor authentication in, that would be very helpful. Um, and again, educating people uh, to be aware of phishing scams and other social engineering scams, that would greatly improve cybersecurity. We also have to uh, make sure that people understand that one of the weakest links that they currently have uh, is their cell phone. So for example, in the House of Representatives, uh, when I first started, I remember that we had a lot of resources devoted to protecting our desktop. And they did a pretty good job of protecting our desktop and the email on our desktop. And um, the folks at House Administration would probably show us all their attacks that they would thwart on any given day. And then I asked the question, and said, well, what about my cell phone? And they said, oh, that's not our responsibility. Except it turns out that my cell phone is connected to the system. A lot of folks actually do their emails on their cell phone, including the government emails. And it was pretty clear to me that that was a pretty major weak link. So through um, letters and, and sort of phone calls and so on, I was glad that we now do require uh, cyber protection on government issued cell phones. And we'll try and get that installed on everyone's private cell phone as well if they're in the House of Representatives. Uh, because if someone hacks my cell phone, then they become me. And if they're me, then they can enter the system as me and start doing stuff. They can start sending emails as me. They can start asking questions as me. Uh, and sometimes they can get information that they shouldn't get. Uh, so um, keep in mind of how, how easy your cell phone is uh, to get hacked. And I'm gonna share one more story. Uh, and it is about the cell phone. 
I remember a few years ago, uh, my staff got a call from 60 Minutes and they said, hey, we want to hack your boss's cell phone. And my staff said, great, we'd love if you did, did that. Uh, so 60 Minutes uh, was nice. They didn't actually hack my own cell phone. Instead, they uh, sent me an Apple iPhone off the shelf. I opened it uh, and turned it on and uh, they called me and they said, okay, we're gonna try to hack uh, your new Apple iPhone. And so basically I had it with me for about a week. I went from DC to uh, my home in Southern California and then back to DC. And I made various calls and text messages on it. And then I went into my interview with 60 Minutes. And the first thing they showed me um, were recordings uh, of conversations I had with people I had called. They also showed me a map of everywhere I had traveled, even though they told me to turn the GPS off on my phone, which I did. And uh, they also said they could monitor my text messages. All of this was in real time, they said. The hackers were in Germany and I was in the US. And what they were exploiting is something known as the uh, SS7 loophole. You can go ahead and search for that inter internet and you can read all about it. And it turns out that what had happened is that decades ago when folks were setting up telephone networks, everyone assumed that if you could set up a telephone network, you would be a trusted network. And folks didn't realize that these trusts and networks could now also be owned by North Korea, by Iran, by Russia, by China, and by criminal syndicates affiliated with these countries. So as long as someone had access to a telephone network, they could essentially hack any cell phone anywhere in the world knowing the phone number, which was why um, during the former administration, I found it really disturbing uh, that the former president of the United States did all sorts of stuff with his cell phone. And um, I am, I'm just not sure if foreign powers were listening in because it had nothing to do with the protections on his cell phone. It had something to do with the fact that he would be using his cell phone, calling one of his friends or one of his associates or anybody else on his cell phone. And if they knew that phone number, they could listen in. Uh, so in any event, uh, this hack was exposed and what I am told, and we have had meetings with telephone companies and other software companies, is they've mitigated this problem. It is not fully fixed, uh, so you should be aware of that problem. Now, for most normal folks, the chance of a foreign power exploiting that loophole to access your cell phone is probably not very high. Most people, however, are much more susceptible to a much easier way of getting hacked, uh, which is accessing a Wi-Fi system uh, that is not a legitimate Wi-Fi system. Uh, so I'll close uh, on this. Uh, I would almost never access public Wi-Fi. If I were you, uh, I would go ahead and buy uh, a mobile hotspot. They're not that expensive and carry that around with you if you want to uh, use Wi-Fi. So let's say you're sitting at LAX airport and you want to use Wi-Fi and up comes two choices. One is LAX, the other is LAX one. Would you know which Wi-Fi was the correct one? Maybe both are correct, maybe one of them isn't. And let's say you connect on the incorrect one, it could be a hacker sitting 15 feet away from you who set up that system. And then within seconds, that hacker will have a lot of information on your cell phone. Some of you may have a cell phone that automatically connects to Wi-Fi. So let's say, you did that at, at LAX. The next time you travel through LAX and your phone automatically connects, it's gonna search for that bad illegitimate Wi-Fi system and it's gonna to try to connect again. Uh, so uh, you could then have more information exposed to the hackers who are setting up that system. Uh, so if folks watching this, if you don't remember anything, remember just don't use public Wi-Fi unless you're absolutely sure that it is the correct Wi-Fi and that's a secure system. And then let me now end by saying what an honor it is to be on here with uh, Congresswoman Yvette Clark. We co-chair the Virtual Reality Caucus. Uh, she is an awesome member of Congress and you're gonna hear some great remarks from her uh, after me. So thank you for having me on and look forward to working with all of you as we make America a, a better place to live, work and play
and less hackable. Thank you. I'm on mute. Thank you, Congressman. And uh, we now have uh, Congresswoman uh, Clark lined up, if she could join us. Hey, hello, Congresswoman. How are you? Thank you so much for having me, Bison. Every day is a holiday. Thank you so much for joining us at Hack the Capitol. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so very much for having me. Greetings, everyone, and good afternoon. I'm Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark, and I proudly represent New York's 9th Congressional District located in Central and South Brooklyn. You know, I'm forever amazed by and in awe of all of the limitations we as a civil society have surpassed through innovation, persistence, and the wonders of technology. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the R Street Institute, the ICS Village, the National Security Institute, and the Cyberbytes Foundation for hosting all of us for their fourth annual Hack and Capital Conference. I'd like to also uh, acknowledge my dear friend and colleague, Congressman Ted Lieu, who has done an extraordinary job in this space from his work on the Intelligence Com Committee, as uh, he has stated, our virtual reality caucus. Ted Lieu uh, is one of our messengers uh, from the House of Representatives in our DPCC and a true technology wonk, as you uh, have learned. As many of you are aware, I currently serve as the chairwoman of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Protection and Innovation Subcommittee on the House Homeland Security Committee. What some of you may not know is that I served as chair of the subcommittee just over 10 years ago. Since that time, the National Protection and Programs Directorate has become the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, also known as CISA. And Congress has empowered the Department of Homeland Security to better execute the federal network security mission, including through the use of binding operational directives and persistent threat hunting, as well as the numerous executive orders and presidential policy directives that have sought to provide clarity on how the federal departments and agencies should work together to secure public and private networks from cyber attacks. Nevertheless, recent cyber incidents from solar winds to hafnium to the breach of the water treatment facility in Oldsmar, Florida, serve as a very stark reminder that progress has come at an unacceptably slow pace in a threat environment where the stakes grow exceptionally and exponentially higher with each passing day. Ten years ago, my subcommittee have held hearings on defending federal networks from sophisticated foreign adversaries, protecting our electric grid and other critical infrastructures from cyber attack, and clarifying the cybersecurity roles and responsibilities of entities across the federal enterprise. If I were to hold those same hearings today, I'm concerned that they wouldn't represent the decades worth of progress relative to the escalation and sophistication of threats that we now face. Add to that new challenges that we must confront from nefarious disinformation campaigns to election and supply chain security. Despite the rapidly evolving pace of threats over the past four years, efforts to mature the federal approach to cybersecurity have been stunted and stymied by interagency turf battles and inconsistent leadership from the White House, and the failure to adequately invest in cybersecurity and the expansion of a workforce commensurate with the ever-expanding evolving threat environment. That said, I believe that this is a promising moment for the federal cybersecurity policy. New leadership in the White House and recent cybersecurity incidents have forced my colleagues in Congress, offices, officials of the administration, and our partners in the private sector to have conversations about bold policy ideas that seem ambitious just a year ago, but make common sense today. 
As chairwoman of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Protection and Innovation Subcommittee, I am excited to harness the momentum for change to improve the nation's cybersecurity posture. So today I'd like to highlight five priorities I have to make meaningful progress on cybersecurity. First, right-sizing CISA's budget, authorities, and the workforce. Next, modernizing federal network security. Then strengthening security partnerships between the federal government and its private sector partners, particularly those critical to the government operations and the economy. Improving the baseline of cybersecurity, of our cybersecurity posture of under-resourced sectors and implementing policies to combat emergence, emerging threats that undermine our democratic institutions, especially through disinformation. You know, CISA has a workforce of about 2,200 people and a budget of a little over $2 billion. A little over Half of CISA's budget supports its cybersecurity mission, which includes securing the networks of about 100 federal agencies and providing cybersecurity assistance to entities with 16 critical infrastructure sectors upon request. For years, the Committee on Homeland Security has worked on a bipartisan basis to increase the funding level of DHS's cybersecurity activities. Last Congress, Committee Democrats led a bipartisan letter urging appropriators to increase, increase funding for CISA and successfully secured a $330 million increase in CISA's FY 2020 budget. With the Biden administration at the White House, I expect more success in right-sizing CISA's budget and authorities this Congress. Already, the Biden administration has demonstrated its commitment to empowering CISA to carry out its mission, seeking $690 million for the agency through the American Rescue Plan. And I'm hopeful that that $650 in down payment uh, that Congress appropriated will be followed up by a more, more budget request that enables CISA to better execute its mission and evolve its security programs to keep pace with the threat environment. Additionally, I'm encouraged by reports of a forthcoming executive order in response to SolarWinds, the SolarWinds compromise, that is expected to improve CISA's visibility of activity on federal networks and establish a cyber incident reporting mechanism. I look forward to partnering with the administration to provide CISA with the full range of authorities it needs to serve as an effective partner to both the federal government and the private sector. The SolarWinds campaign also raised important questions about the efficacy of CISA's existing federal network security programs, like the Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program, also known as CDM, and the National Cybersecurity Protection System. In particular, SolarWinds called into question the security value of these programs in light of the increased use of encryption, cloud adoption, and other technological innovations. I am pleased the, that CISA is thinking creatively about how to evolve these programs, but it shouldn't take a crisis to make sure that security keeps pace with technology. So moving forward, I will call on CISA to more frequently assess its suite of security programs and modernize them as appropriate. But CISA's uh, success rests on more than the deployment of tools. It will require a talented workforce capable of analyzing new data and acting strategically based upon it. Toward that end, I will push DHS to fully leverage its special hiring authorities and create new talent pipelines. While the, <clears throat> excuse me, while the, uh, the federal network security will be a top priority, the national security consequences of cybersecurity policy reach far beyond our federal networks. Successful collaboration between the federal government and the private sector are critical 
to protecting U.S. interests in cyberspace, both on and off federal networks. The SolarWinds campaign and related compromises have reinvigorated con conversations about how the federal government can best support private sector security efforts and what obligations private sector entities ought to have to the government. You know, last year's National Defense Authorization Act included recommendations by the Cyberspace Sol Solarium Commission to facilitate better collaboration between the government and private sectors, including establishing the Joint Cyber Planning Office at CISA. But important provisions in the House passed bill, including language establishing a cyber incident reporting framework and a joint collab collaborative environment were left out of the final package. Together, these provisions would have helped improve cyber threat information sharing and analysis and situational awareness of both the federal government and the private sector. Other solarium recommendations, including the codification of systemically important critical infrastructure, were not even considered. Recent cyber events, however, demand the Congress carefully consider proposals that will ensure more strategic collaboration between the federal government and the private sector on cybersecurity matters. From state and local governments to the healthcare sector to water treatment facilities, opportunistic cyber attacks have disrupted operations, delayed the delivery of services, cost the economy, and consume the time and energy of cyber talent. Too often, successful operations rely on exploiting vulnerabilities in outdated, unsupported software and poor cyber hygiene practices, as was uh, demonstrated by my colleague, Ted Liu. Meanwhile, investigations are hamstrung by insufficient logging and limited forensics. Improving the baseline cybersecurity posture across critical infrastructure sectors is crucial to ensuring the continuity of operations of affected industries and freeing up cyber talent to defend against more sophisticated threats. So toward that end, in the coming weeks, I will introduce the State and Local Cybersecurity Improvement Act. This is bipartisan legislation that authorizes $400 million grant, a $400 million grant program aimed at improving the cybersecurity posture of state and local cybersecurity governments. The legislation passed the House in the last Congress, and I'm looking forward to it getting enacted into law. Additionally, I believe the administration's infrastructure package, the American Jobs Plan, is an opportunity to ensure that security is integrated into critical infrastructure projects at the beginning and not patched in or tacked on at the end. I'm committed to working with stakeholders to find opportunities to ensure that our critical infrastructure is resilient to the cyber threats that we face. And then finally, the federal government's approach to cybersecurity must be sufficiently dynamic to respond to emerging threats, particularly threats aimed at undermining public confidence in democratic institutions. In recent years, our, our adversaries exploited social media to spread disinformation and sow discord among the public. As a member of both the Committee on Homeland Security and the Committee on Energy and Commerce, I've participated in countless debates about how to chart a path forward that respects Americans' free speech rights, but limits malicious disinformation. So as we observed on January 6th, the unchecked spread of disinformation has real national security consequences. Moving forward, we must explore opportunities to inoculate the public from disinformation with authentic information and demand more transparency from platform operators. So the public then understands that news feeds are, are populated. For four years, federal efforts to raise our national cybersecurity posture across federal networks, 
state and local governments, and the private sector suffered from a lack of steady, consistent leadership from the White House, leaving agencies to pursue piecemeal approaches to cybersecurity. President Biden has made clear from the start that he is taking a different approach, nominating seasoned experts to national security positions across the board. And finally, we will continue our work to secure the nation's elections from both malicious cyber campaigns as well as disinformation campaigns. Success in the 117th Congress will come down to sound policy, strong coordination, and sufficient resources. The Homeland Security Committee can deliver sound policy. It is ready to work with any committee or agency necessary to move the ball forward legislatively. And we will continue to advocate that the cybersecurity missions across the federal enterprise, especially CISA, are well resourced. Finally, we will continue our work to secure the nation's elections and we will modernize our federal network security programs, which as currently deployed are not suited to prevent or identify a solar wind style compromise. We must raise the baseline cybersecurity posture across government entities, the private sector, to reduce avoidable opportunistic attacks so that we can focus our talent, time, and resources on preventing, detecting, and eliminating more sophisticated attacks. Raising the nation's baseline cybersecurity posture will require a systemic approach to cybersecurity. Cybersecurity defense is a system and it requires a targeted systemic approach. That means collaboration and partnership between the private sector and the federal, state, and local governments. It means comprehensive legislation. And I'm so proud to say that the Biden-Harris American Recovery Package includes investments in modern, more sophisticated, and secure technologies. It authorizes cybersecurity grants for state and local governments to bring them the resources they desperately need to repel compromises, both small and substantial. This administration recognizes the need for quick investment to modernize and secure federal networks, and I'm committed to doing everything in my power to ensure that the funding is enacted. And to that end, I will seek opportunities that include targeted support for these networks through state and local cybersecurity, through the State and Local Cybersecurity Improvement Act. My committee will prioritize the reintroduction and its consideration. If we intend to meet the modern day challenges of the 21st century, we need to continue our comprehensive innovation efforts. The Department of Homeland Security, like any organization, is the sum of its employees. If we are to maximize the department's effectiveness, it starts with maximizing its employee satisfaction through good, moral, and paid for their good, moral, and patriotic work. And it means prioritizing equity and diversity. It starts with bringing diversity to every level of DHS. Cybersecurity requires diversity because let's be clear, cybersecurity affects a myriad of people. Cyber racism is racism. Cyber xenophobia is xenophobia. Our diversity is our strength and we must ensure every Homeland Security employee is proud to say that they work in Homeland Security. So let me take this opportunity to thank you all for participating in this conference. Let me thank all of the uh, organizations who collaborated to bring this information to you for a job well done. And let me encourage you to follow me on Twitter at Rep Yvette Clark, Instagram at Rep Yvette Clark, and on Facebook as Congresswoman Yvette D. Clark. Whoops, Yvette Clark. And let's be sure to sign up for my newsletter at clark.house.gov. 
So to everyone in attendance today, stay strong, stay healthy, stay safe, wear your mask, and get vaccinated. And have a wonderful rest of your conference. Thank you for having me. Thank you, ma'am, for your remarks. And um, we appreciate your support here 